Last week I told you we'd be looking at the two approaches, the two understandings of how Christians can think through violence in the world today. How do we respond to violence? How do we handle that? This last week we looked at just war. This week we're looking at, at pacifism. I told you that I would present them to the best of my ability and then you would be able to choose which one uh, you wanted to line up with. Last week we looked at the just war tradition, the argument that uh, we as a can form people who are so able to love our neighbors that even when our neighbor is our enemy, we could go so far as to wield a gun as an act of love, a way to uh, wage war uh, as a way of loving our neighbor in a hard situation. This week, we're, we're turning to the other way that Christians understand violence and what is commonly called pacifism, though I don't think that's really the best term for it. I'd rather use something like nonviolent resistance. Not quite as short, but I think it's more accurate. First, I, I do want to ask, though, was any of, the, of those of you who were here last week, did it, who figured out the, the huge flaw with the sermon? There was a very, very large flaw with last week's sermon. Massive. Right. Sally. You're right. There, was there much Bible in last week's sermon? Not at all. It was a, a Bible deficient sermon, which makes it more of a lecture, honestly. But um, that was the problem. The problem with the just war tradition is that it, it, as we talk about just cause, right intent, proportionality, that uh, it takes this verse out of the Bible, love your neighbor, and the fact that there is war in the Old Testament, and, and it builds this whole way of thinking that, has, that doesn't at all reference, refer, or is based upon the, the nation of Israel or the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The just war theory, that just war tradition, it, it's coherent, it makes sense, but it's not in the end rooted in scripture. What we see as we look at scripture, uh, as we look at, at the arc of scripture when it comes to dealing with violence, is we see this long-term pattern that begins with God saying, yes, there is war, now restrain it, with the, the, war, the laws about war in Deuteronomy 20. And, and then it's restrained further uh, in Judges, Judges 7. Gideon, one of the judges, takes an army to war, and, and God tells him the only people you can take to war are the ones that they went down to the river and... Um, they drank, uh, the soldiers drank water, and, and God said, only the soldiers who lean over to lap water out of the river like dogs, you can only take them. The ones who use water and, and like you cup their hands to drink it, you got to send those home. And so Gideon goes to war with an army of 300 people, and, and God is teaching Gideon, you, you have to rely on me. You cannot rely on war and violence to, to produce righteousness. And then we have the prophets who start showing up and saying things like, you're going to beat your spears and to plows. The prophet Isaiah talks about the coming of the Prince of Peace. And then finally the Prince of Peace shows up. The one who refuses to use violence to save himself. And instead you, uh, seeks our salvation through accepting the violence of the cross. This becomes part of the life of, of the church. We see uh, Paul saying things like overcome evil with good in Romans 12. And then the Bible rounds out with a revelation in Revelation 19, the second coming of Jesus. The sword that conquers the world is not the sword that Jesus holds in his hand to cut the people down, but the sword that comes out of his mouth. It is the words that he speaks. And so if we look at the, the arc of Scripture, not just at one point, but the overarching line of Scripture, there's this movement from violence towards a beautiful community, a, a non-violent uh, community, a way of following Jesus. And if we attend closely to what Jesus does, the Jesus, the one in whose footsteps we seek to walk, we, we, we see things like, um, he doesn't teach the golden rule, treat others like you want to be treated. He gives a new commandment, the Last Supper in John. He says, love others as I have loved you. And Jesus never loves anyone by pulling a weapon on them. Right? We, we hear Jesus teach we must carry our own cross, that we might suffer and die because of this. And that we must never kill in his name for Jesus Peter to put the sword down when Peter picks one up in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Jesus teaches the overcoming of evil not through violence, but through standing up to evil in ways that are imaginative, that seek a third way between rolling over and just taking it and uh, resisting with violence. We see uh, him like saying, if, if someone forces you to walk a mile, walk a second mile. The context of that being... A Roman soldier could force anyone to carry their, their backpack for him. And that's a 60 pound backpack. That, that's kind of heavy. Uh, but a soldier could not force them to carry it more than a mile. And so if you go ahead and carry the backpack another mile, who's in charge then? It goes from being a way for Roman soldiers to oppress and, and it's a form of violence against the community. And, and if you say, no, I'm, now I'm going to carry the second mile, you're taking control of the situation. This is the same type of thing if someone asks for the, the cloak off your back, give them your shirt because they might force you to take, they might be able to force you to get a hand over the cloak, but if you now then hand them the shirt, you're, you're taking control of the situation here. This is what we see Jesus doing with, with the woman caught, caught in adultery. Some of you might be wondering, what about the man? It takes two. That's a whole other sermon. But what about the woman caught in adultery? Um, Jesus does not uh, pull out a sword and, and, and say, yes, it is time to kill her, or, and picks up a stone and starts to stone her. He does not attack the ones who would stone, him, stone her. He doesn't take sides that way. Instead, he, he asks a question that breaks it open. He says, you who, you who are without sin, you cast the first stone. He finds a way to, to avoid violence. And when Jesus is faced with imminent violence that cannot be avoided, he takes it upon himself this happens in the Garden of Gethsemane when he says, let my disciples go free even though you're going to take me. Finally, when Jesus is crucified, he accepts suffering as the cost of forgiveness. This way of the cross, this way of, of stubbornly resisting evil but refusing to use violence, this is how Jesus saves. This is how Jesus forgives. This is salvation. There is no plan B to the cross. There's no way you can sort of get around this. To follow Jesus is to carry your cross, and the cross is to accept violence but not return it. What we call pacifism, I, I think a better term for it would be uh, nonviolent resistance. This is how God works in the world. It's how God works in creation. It's how God works to transform and save. It is how God works. It is how Jesus works. And if we're going to follow him, can we do anything else? Followers of Jesus that embrace this stubborn, nonviolent resistance do so out of a belief that Jesus doesn't change the, just change the world down the road in the life to come, but that Jesus changes the world here. Jesus is not just about down the road, by and by, after we die. Jesus changes what is possible today. And so to take up our sword today is to deny that Jesus is active in the world today, that Jesus is our Lord today, for Jesus would never take up the sword. That Jesus can be the Lord of what happens after I die, but today I'm going to do whatever I decide, and that might be take up the sword. That, that's following Jesus at a safe distance. It, it doesn't really look like discipleship to me. Based on this belief, it can be argued that those who gather in the name of Jesus are not just practicing nonviolent resistance individually, but what we are doing when we gather in the name of Jesus is we are creating a community that is the alternative to the ways of war. There are nations out there and gatherings of people who see war as a valid option, and we who gather in the name of Jesus say no. That is not an option for us. We don't have to get rid, we don't have to rid the world of war. That's Jesus' job. Instead, we are to live as the proof that there is a better way. And that better way responds to evil uh, directly. We, we respond as followers of Jesus. We don't roll over and go passive. I think that's the biggest flaw of using the word pacifism. It implies that the way we respond to evil is we just roll over and say, okay, well, that's a shame. That's not what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels. We see Jesus responding, in whatever, responding to evil and resisting in whatever way he could, but not using violence to do so. And we see in what Jesus teaches that we cannot fight our way to peace. What, the only way to get to peace is to be peaceful. And so we gather as a community around Jesus to respond to evil as a way of life that names evil, that obstructs it, that forgives offenders, that suffers violence, that builds a better way, but denies that war is ever 
a good option. So, if a follower of Jesus is someone who rejects violence, there are two questions that ha are always asked. As soon as you talk about pacifism, there are always two questions that inevitably come up. The first one is, does it work? Right? The whole argument about being nonviolent and nonviolent resistance, the, the argument is always, does it work? Is it effective? Let me respond by two, asking two questions first. Do you ever read anywhere in the Bible about being effective? Blessed are the effective, for they shall be called good churchgoers. Does effective ever come up? No. Effective is not in the Bible. We are called to be faithful, we are called to be committed, but we are not called to be effective. We are called to follow Jesus. And I think the other question we need to ask when we start talking about effectiveness is, if the goal is peace, how effective is war at bringing about peace? Right? How effective is war? Look at the last century. You remember what the first uh, title of World War I was? It was called World War I or the Great War, but what was it also called? The war to end all wars, right? How'd that go? Right? How'd the war to end all wars, it ended with the Treaty of Versailles, a vindictive, self-serving treaty that the French and British used to abstract, to, to, to pull as many goods, as many resources out of Germany as possible because they wanted to keep Germany crippled while they rebuilt their own infrastructure. And if you kick a dog again and again and again, you know what that dog's going to do? It's going to bite, right? If you kick Germany, you kick a nation, you, if you're that vindictive and self-serving long enough, it, World War II was inevitable. It was going to happen. Regar I, this is a little bit of an aside, but I came across this great survey this last week. The Pew Trust did a survey about technology in the future, and they asked, what is the technology you most want, most want to see invented? And one out of ten said, time travel. And then at, when asked, what would you do with a time machine? One out of ten of them would said, kill Hitler. And so statistically speaking, one out of a hundred people you meet want to make a time machine and go kill Hitler. And uh, and so it begs the question, like, why do we want to kill Hitler? Because it would avoid World War II? No. The Treaty of Versailles was so horrible, something was going to happen. Hitler just happened to be the name of what did happen. And, and so World War I, the, world, uh, the war to end all wars, did, did it end wars across the nation? Actually, it's planted the seeds for more wars. Because, you know, who remember who ruled the Middle East before World War I? is the Ottoman Empire, right? And before World War I, in the Ottoman Empire, there was peace. When the Ottoman Empire fell after World War I, Britain and France drew lines in the sand and they created the modern Middle East nations as we know them. And because they were self-serving, putting themselves before love of neighbor, you know what we got after World War I in the Middle East? What we have today, a continuous unfolding nightmare of violence. We, we can sort I can continue with like this for a while, but I think the point becomes obvious. War, you can't fight a war to get to peace. It just doesn't work. To fight war to get to peace, it, wars always plant the seeds of, their, of the next war. And so, again, look across the last century. What are the major changes that have happened in the world that have stuck and, and have worked that have not blown nations apart? The fall of apartheid in South Africa, nonviolent resistance, 1960s civil rights, nonviolent resistance, and peace in Ireland. Again, nonviolent resistance. And if you know anything about the history of those places, before nonviolent resistance brought together the people and, and brought peace, people were dying there left and right. It was, it was horrible, really. And so, if you're going to ask whether pacifism is effective, I think it is at least as effective as war and probably quite a bit better. So that's the first question that comes up whenever we talk about uh, pacifism or nonviolent resistance. The other one is, is always the even more loaded question of, what if someone threatened a person you loved? Could you use violence then? Right, this is the whole, I could use violence in, in, in self-defense. If you want to learn more about this, there, I, if a violent person threatened to harm a loved one, whole book about this, that I, little short book, you might be interested in reading it. But here's the, the short version. As a Christian, can I ask someone else to suffer for my beliefs, even when it comes to this? 
Well, are your beliefs true? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that on the other side of death is the kingdom of God? If you believe this, and it is the truth, why wouldn't you be willing to let someone else suffer for the truth? This is what Jesus does, right? He looks at his disciples and what does he say? Foxes have lairs, but I don't have a bed. And guess what? You're probably not going to either. Jesus says, carry your cross. If you follow Jesus, you're going to carry your cross and you're going to suffer. And so are the other Christians. And so if it comes to this moment and someone else is holding a gun to a loved one who also follows Jesus, do you kill on their behalf? I can tell you I would never want you to kill on my behalf. I would get in the way of a bullet for you, but I would not kill for you. Right? That's what it means to follow Jesus. I will not kill for you. I would take a bullet for you. I'd rather not. Please, let's not try it. But, but I will not kill for you. Because Jesus would not kill for you. Jesus didn't have to. Jesus carried the cross. Now this, talking about pacifism, it, 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 it affects us more than just when it comes to foreign policy because none of us really impact foreign policy all that much. But it, it further shapes how we live day by day. We, to embrace nonviolent resistance is to commit to never roll over, never just take it, never submit to evil, to lies, to abuse, but to always stand up, but never to do so violently. And the temptation for us often is not violence in action. Often the temptation is violence of words. Whoever said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, was lying. Because sticks and stones may break my bones, but words make me think I deserved it. Right? We use words that are horrible and violent. I think the worst four-letter word out there is hate. I think that is the one four-letter word we should avoid at all costs. I think it's a violent and horrible word. We remember that Jesus saved all of humanity without resorting to violence, and as his followers, do we have any reason to do anything else? So that's it. That's uh, just war and pacifism. Last week was just war, and I was... I think I can say I was just as forceful in my presentation of that as I was in pacifism this week. And so you have to choose which one you embrace. Just war? Do you believe in the formation of people who are so just that they can be trusted to love neighbors even when that means using violence? as this world seems to require at times? Or pacifism? Do you believe that we are formed as followers of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to so follow him that we were re so that we would reject any violence, for that's what he would do. Your call, your decision. I'd be interested to know what many of you think. Amen. <laughs>